<clears throat> What's going on, guys? This is Beat the Line First Look. We're looking at the uh, UFC Denver card. Um, it's nothing special. Thankfully, the dog father's here to join me, Key and Dravi. Nowhere to be found. Um, we all we all know how this goes. Um, we're gonna make this quick. There's not really much to say here. I think I'm gonna figure out a fucking screen share here. Present screen share. Perfect share. All right. So let's start. We'll take start looking at this card right now. First fight of the night we have is Josh Fremd versus Andre Petroski. Uh Josh Fremd, 30 years old, 6'4, 76 inch reach. Petroski, 33, six, six foot, 73 inch reach. Um, I mean, Petroski just got knocked out shooting a takedown on Malcoon last fight, if I remember correctly. Right now, odds are about to pick him for these two. Dog, you like anything here? I kind of think this is a Petroski spot, if anything, right? <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't mind Petroski here personally. I mean, his cardio is not great, and it's at elevation. You know, that's going to be the one talking point that we hear endlessly this week. And to be honest, I'm probably going to want to jump off a bridge by the end of it um, or next week. Uh, by the end of it, I'll probably want to jump off a bridge because that's all we're going to hear. Petrovsky does have cardio issues and some fragility, but what he does bring is great wrestling and a good submission game, which, you know, Fremd doesn't really have great takedown defense. And to be honest, I know he doesn't have great cardio, but he could top time him here for 15. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, he's not a bad striker either, but he is super fragile. So, I mean, I'll probably stay away because I don't think I can trust either guy, but I do think Petrovsky has a lot of top time upside. Um, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. I'll get the Petrosky bet, but I'm not really interested. But, you know, you can always bet Petrosky, and then if you don't like how things are going, just live bet off after a round and call it a day. That's kind of how I'm kind of looking at this, too. Um, I think Petrosky's aside, you know, first look. Um, I just, Josh Frem's not really impressive, and Petrosky has had, you know, glimmers of looking like a pretty decent fighter. So I kind of think – at pick em odds, you're probably best off going with Petrovsky. But like you said, you're probably going to wait and see if this line moves at all. Um, Let's see. Where, who did he – so he lost a copy law of liver kick, beat Jamie Pickett, beat Cedric Dumas. All right. And then this is Malkoon and Pereira. Yeah. So, I mean, Petrovsky's fighting the better fighters too. If you look at, like, who they've faced so far. Actually, I guess he fought Fluffy two years ago. Framed. But – I don't know. Um, next fight in this card we got is Vivian Arujo versus Jasmine Jazza, Jazu Davicius. Um, is this still screen sharing? What do we got? How, why is it doing this shit? Screen share. Entire screen. Share. All right, let's do it this way. Whoa. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're looking at Vivian Rujo versus Jasmine Jasu Um Vivian Rujo, 37, 5'4", 68 inch reach. Jasmine, 35, 5'7", 68 inch reach. Um, right now, odds on these two women, you can get um, Arujo anywhere from plus 140 to plus 126. You can get Jasmine anywhere from minus 160 to minus 170. Um, my first look at this one, um, I kind of like Jasmine here. I think her pace pressure and wrestling will give Arujo issues probably later in the fight too. Um, she's obviously older. Um, Jasmine just had a camp change. She's at SBG now. Um, she's constantly, I think getting better. Even though she's 35, she's still like got a good wrestling background, everything like that. She just beat Priscilla Cochera, Tracy Cortez. She lost to, which was a pretty good fight. Beat Miranda Maverick. Natalia Silva lost. I mean, that's impressive. Uh, Silva just showed elite takedown defense in that one, if I remember. Jennifer Maya is a pretty good win. Rebus, Grasso. I guess, actually, she has a lot of better strength of schedule. What do you think, your dog father? Anything for you? Yeah, I'm probably going to pass. I, I, I actually think there's probably some value on Ruho. She's fought, in my opinion, the much Better level of competition, Grasso, Ebas, Jennifer Maya, and Natalia Silva. Definitely, definitely. She fought. She she had a pretty somewhat competitive fight with Chuk as well. Like the the issue with her is obviously stylistically, it's not the best fight um, because I I don't know if she's going to land takedowns. Um, <clears throat> and you know there hasn't been a lot of 
historical data from my thought process, I'd have to look, you know, is Jasmine's a good wrestler, but can she, how she look off her back? I mean, when Aharuhu gets people down, I mean, she's very good on top. She's good at taking the back. Um, she could consolidate position. I mean, it could be a sloppy fight in round three where, you know, <clears throat> you think uh, Aruho is gas, and then she gets a takedown and gets back, gets her back and holds position. So I like Aruho in the matchup. I don't think I'm going to bet it, but probably another spot where you bet Aruho pre. And like I said, I mean, she's pretty – she gets tired, but she's really, really good early. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there's some value on the live line on Jasmine after one. So I'll probably just wait and see that plays out, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> no interest on the side pre. Cause yeah, so I'm just, I'm just going to show people quickly. Like, you, you made a very good point. We don't know how Jasmine is off her back. So, you know, from a handicapper standpoint or if I'm looking at, like, I'm about to go watch tapes, for example, I pull up UFC fight stats. I go over here and I look at, you know, Natalia Silva had two takedowns in her fight and Kay Hansen had one takedown in her fight. So if you want to look to see how she's been doing off her back, you know, now you know where to go at least think to look. Um, other than that, like, I guess Miranda Maverick would be a good look, too, because that's kind of wrestler versus wrestler. I mean, even Tracy Cortez was uh, is a pretty good wrestler and she got Tracy Cortez down. So I don't know. This one could be interesting. I think I'm going to lean Jasmine, but I kind of like your live angle as well. Um, okay, you can never go wrong with a live angle. You can never be upset about it, honestly. Um, let's look at the next fight here. Luana Santos versus Maria Agapova. Uh, Luana Santos is 24, 5, 6, 67 inch reach. She's fighting Maria Agapova, 27, 5, 6, 68 and a half inch reach. If I'm remembering this correctly. Um, Lines are getting a little wide here. Minus 225 for Santos. Um, Agapova plus 190 to plus 180. If I remember correctly, um, this girl Agapova can't stop a takedown, right? Am I wrong, dog? Me, you probably have a better memory than I do about this one. I mean, to be honest with you, it's not bad, but she just kind of – her last two fights, I mean, it's – it's. I mean, the, the Dobson fight too. I mean, she kind of just gets worn down as the fight goes on. I don't think she has – She's not bad takedown defense early, but with her gas tank, she kind of gets worn down if you press a grappling pace, which mm. Luan will do. So it is kind of a nightmare matchup for her. Um, she's not as bad of a grappler as people think. Like she had Morosa's back for a second in round one after she got out of a body triangle on the contender series when she fought Tracy Cortez a long time ago. She got yep. dominated in the wrestling and grappling, but you know she was 22 at the time. Um, but the issue with her is like, we just don't know what she's been up to. She's coming off an ACL injury in 2022, um, and has gone through some camp changes, some life issues. Um, so was she the one who didn't have a home and like, was yeah, she was Buka like sponsored her, her home or whatever. And she had a grappling match in karate combat recently with a beast That's from John, uh, John Danner's team. Um, didn't, but not really relevant, but she did get in to some competitive setting uh, in May, which is, I guess, a little bullish for her side. But, yeah, I mean, she's obviously been grappling a little bit. Um, it's just really hard to know what product you get because at some point in time, people have thought that she was, like, a legitimate prospect. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I think she was Pickham to Moreau's or, like, a slight dog. But she was a pretty decent-sized dog to Moreau's and Jillian, but, like, she's a much bigger dog here than – she was to uh, both of those girls. So it's uh, it's interesting to see what the market thinks about this fight. Um, I kind of thought Luana Santos would have been wider, to be honest. Uh, I guess, oh, she did open minus 400. That's kind of what I would have thought that too. Just because like you said, it, this is like a nightmare for her kind of with like the matchmaking. And then, I, I, evidently, if you look at her career, Jillian Robertson, uh, not really Moreau's, um, Dobson or Cortez, really. Cortez, one, two, three. They're giving her a bunch of wrestlers and sub, subbed, and dominated, it looks like. So I don't know. Surprised it's not. I guess you're kind of getting the short end of the stick right now with Santos, but I don't know if I'm like, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's hard to really know how good Santos is. Like, I know people were pretty bullish about her somewhat dominating Edgar, but like, if you can't, Edgar, Edgar's old as shit, right? Edgar's, Edgar's old, and she's kind of submission or bust most times. So if you're yeah. a decent 
grappler, you're really, you're really not going to get anything going. I mean, um, I guess yeah, the, and, 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 Jenna, and, and Jenna Bishop's a grappler too. Like her one loss in LFA that was competitive. So we haven't really seen her take on like a pretty good striker yet. I don't really rate her striking at all. She's probably going to get lit up on the feet by Agapova, which is why I can see the line not blowing up as much as it is. Mm, okay. That's good. It's good to know. Something to look at too. Keep clicking to that screen of the stream yard recording, and it's like tripping me out. Um, Juana Santos is kind of a baddie too, honestly. Just going off the profile picture here. Um, next fight is C Rod versus Julian Arosa. Julian, uh, Julian Arosa, 34, 6'1, 74 and a half inch reach. Um, C Rod is 26, 5'7, 71 inch reach. Right now, the odds of these two guys, you can get. Um, C Rod anywhere from minus uh, 225 to minus 260. You can get Julian Rose anywhere from plus 190 to plus 210. Um, anyone who follows me on Telegram knows I actually already have a fight uh, bet on this fight. I played Julian Arosa. Um, I think A. Um, C Rod is really, he's, even though he can, he's a weight bully and uh, he should be a 135er, he just does want to make it so now he's being forced to fight 145 and julian rosa is huge for 145 so i think he's going to struggle with the distance um when it comes to grappling wrestling i think uh julian rosa is going to beat him to the positions um the one thing i feel like you got to worry about with rosa is the um the chin of his but c rod doesn't really show any threatening knockout power in my opinion so i don't really think you have to worry about that there now you're getting a dog at elevation Sherrod's also a dog, but I don't know. I kind of think, you know, Christian Rodriguez has fought JSP as a vet, uh, lost that fight. All the prospects they've given to Rod, C Rod beats him up. This is another vet who's pretty skilled and well rounded. So I think I'm going to play him two to one. Seems a little wide. What do you think, dog? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I have a bet on a Rosa at 215, uh, just for a unit, nothing crazy. Yeah. Uh, kind of share the same sentiments from a market perspective. You know, he's. Minus 160, minus one, 135 to minus 150 range to Cameron Simon. And he's been an underdog in every other UFC fight. Um, so it's hard for me to understand the market change on this guy for, you know, beating a couple, in my personally, in my opinion, a couple unproven guys, um, Simon Dolgarian and Rosas. This is the most proven guy. <clears throat> and he's a veteran. Um, Arosa is good everywhere. Obviously, it's not just the chin; he's just really hittable. Um, there's been some pretty iffy performances, like the uh, <clears throat> the split with uh, Peterson that everybody's going to reference. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Peterson's also kind of like not the best matchup for him because he's also a dude that just kind of like doesn't go away. But <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's it's a. It's a tricky matchup to cap, but there's got to be some value on a Rosa at 215. I mean, um, if you if you look also, dude, we got Charles Jardine, Hakeem Dewudu, um, Nate Landweir, Sean Woodson. Like, Julian Rosa as a dog, fucking covers. Fucking covers. He lost as a fate, or he won in that split decision in Peterson was when he was a favorite. You look at this, plus 180, plus 127, plus 375. Like, he covers as a dog, so... Plus two thirty against Jamal. But it's the reason the reason he's the underdog in all of these fights is it's it's the chin issue mm -hmm. with and the know. age probably. <laughs> yeah, he's thirty four. I mean, uh, he's getting up there, but yeah, a lot of the times you get a good price on him because of the chin. Um, like all these mm -hmm. obvious things that happen in fights, like they get baked into the price, and clearly based on the historical data, you know, in the market, they've over they've over. They've overstated the value of how bad, you know, Arosa's chin is and understated his skill level, um, which is why we're getting him an underdog price. I mean, we see it every week that this guy's going to land takedowns and then they don't, and they look like the underdog. So another obvious spot for me to bet Arosa. I think there's value on him. <clears throat> I, think the, I think the decision line is actually not bad. It will hopefully, depending on what the decision line is, I'll probably take a poke at the decision line too because – it might yeah, have, got props yet. Um, but you know, Rose is a pretty good finisher. Like I, I, I have to, I'm just going to play the money line because, you know, C rods faced some guys that are pretty good finishers, but I gotta be honest. Like he's, 
this is he's one of the more dangerous guys in my opinion that C-Rod's face. So Yeah, I agree with that. But I don't know, dude. C-Rod's like defensively, he's pretty defensively sound, I feel like, pretty much everywhere. Like solid chin. Doesn't really put himself in bad positions with the submission game from what I saw. Um, unless I missed something, but I don't know. Um, I think I like that. I like that book at the decision. That would probably be pretty, pretty, I'm assuming we'd probably get pretty big odds on that. Right. So, I mean, what do we get? Plus 450, maybe plus 500. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. I mean, he definitely has some decision equity here, but, um, with how the price is right now, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the four or 500 range yet. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. All right, bumping up to the main card. Do you think they're going to add fo- – uh, guys, obviously I'm recording this video. It's Monday, July 1st. So, like, by the time next week comes and we drop the real episode, um, there p- could be more fights put on. Um, could be fights off at this rate with the, how the UFC is going. So, I don't know. But it's what we got in front of us now. Um, next one, Cody Brundage versus uh, Abdul Razak Alassane. Uh, Cody Brundage is 30. He's 6 feet, 72-inch reach. Abdul Razak Hassan is 38, 5'10", 73-inch reach at a Fortis MMA. Um, and these two gentlemen, Brundage, plus 130 to plus 150. Uh, Al Razak Hassan is minus 155 to minus 160. Dog, I'm going to have you go first here, man. What do you think? Um, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier. What are you thinking about this one? Yeah, I have nothing to say about this fight of value. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, I thought I thought about playing the under, but, I mean, Razak's pretty durable. Like, after I got into some tape, I mean, he's only been knocked out <clears throat> by chaos, which I take nothing from. I mean, Brundage has a lot of power, and he could probably hurt him. I just don't know, like, what his upside is outside of that in this fight because, you know, all sounds pretty durable. He's 38, though, um, so – I guess, and, you know, Brundage is going to be at home. So it could be pretty bullish for Brundage here on the uh, the money line side just because it seems like they're giving him a bit of a show-me spot uh, with a lot of positive uh, variables for him. And he's the I, under. I, yeah, I also feel like Brundage, although, like, he's not technically, I kind of feel like Brundage is a company guy because like, he takes every fight they give him, like, they fed him Bo Nickel. They gave him Zach Reese. They gave him Jacob Malcoon. They gave him Rodolfo Vieira. They gave him Cedric Dumas. Like they're just giving him. Yeah, I guess they didn't like. I don't know. They didn't get. He hasn't had an easy path here. You know, right? he came in and the first fight he got was uh, Nick Maximoff. Right. Um, I don't remember the Dalcha fight. I didn't tape that one. Treshawn Gore knocked him out. You know, Chinny Treshawn is. Um, Mikal, pretty good. Rodolfo, I don't know. I feel like, honestly, I kind of like Cody Brundage here, especially like you said, at home. I think this is a spot where they're trying to set him up. And like going back and watching that Bo Nickel fight, like although he did get taken down and beat up, um, because honestly, that first round was impressive with Bo Nickel. Like he put, he shoved Bo Nickel off, kept him off him for a little bit, and actually looked like half decent against Bo Nickel. But we don't really know how we rate Bo Nickel striking, obviously. It's very a question mark still, in my opinion. Um, I don't know. I think I'd probably be willing to take the dog shot here, but like, do you think he finishes or do you, or what do you think about that over under? They're probably going to give us a one and a half here. I, I, I don't think they could give you anything else. In one I mean, uh, yeah, it'll definitely open up at one and a half. Um, one, one, two. Yeah, I wouldn't be, I, I don't know what the price will be on under, under one and a half just because Rizak's like historically pretty durable, but. Hard to hard to hard to like. I just don't know if Brundage could finish him. I, I guess he could with like an overhand or a guillotine, but um, that's about the only two ways I can see a yeah, finish. I, I think the sub. I think it would be the sub more than the KO, honestly. Because honest on the feet, uh, Abdul might give him some problems on the feet. Like, Abdul's a pretty good striker. It's funny he, they call him Judo Thunder. We haven't seen him use his judo in the UFC yet, really. Like. He, he wrestled Buckley in round three a good bit um, in that fight. So, Yeah, Buckley looked like he wrestled too. Damn, going to a split decision with Buckley. But that's like old Buckley. It's not the modern-day Buckley. Um, dude, he's kind of fought everyone too looking back. Nico Price, Manir Lazez, Chaos, Malcoon. Yeah. Um, I don't know. 
I think I'm probably going to – I can't believe I'm – it's just so hard to put your name on YouTube next to Cody Brundage and be like, I'm picking him. I'm going with this guy, you know? Just something about it doesn't sit right. Um, next fight is uh, – Gabriel Bonfim versus Angelusa. Uh, Gabriel Bonfim is 26, 6 1 with a 72 and a half inch reach. Um, uh, uh, Angelusa, 30, 5 10, 74 inch reach. Um, I don't know. I just got notifications that LFA lines dropped. Did you tape any of the LFA at all? <clears throat> Those have been out for a while today. Oh, really? I was just getting the fight. I got that like fight. Odds, IO, Twitter that just bounces odds out. Damn, minus 500 for Samuel Diaz, minus 500 for Duarte. Makes sense. Um, yeah, what do you think of this? Bonfim, we last time we saw Bonfim out here, he was beating the shit out of Nick, Nicholas Dalby until Nicholas Dalby just doesn't die. He gassed himself out, a general and dumped in front of his home crowd for his first, you know, big fight in Brazil in the UFC, and then ends up just getting finished by Dalby, who is relentless. And we know um, we know that Ange Luce is a relatively durable guy. Like, we don't really see him getting finished. Has he even – has he been finished before? Um, I don't think he even has. Has he been finished? Uh, I guess he – no, he's never been finished. So, like, we know Ange Luce is durable. He's no, you know, cardio freak or volume freak. But what do you think here? Do you think Bonfim is going to be able to finish him? Or do you think we see Bonfim win his first decision here? That could be a pretty <laughs> – yeah, I think, I think I think Bonfim finishes him. Okay, how do you think he gets it done? I like, I like, I like, like Bonfim here a lot, honestly. Like, I think the line's fine. Um, I don't know if people aren't going to love that because of his last fight, but I'm not a really big Angelusa guy. I don't really like his game. He's kind of just, like, super basic. Throws one-twos down the middle. Um, pretty physical, but he's kind of slow, kind of gassy. Um had a good fight with Jack Della, I guess, which people will always reference when they talk about him. Yeah. But he was still – he still got rocked by Reed McKee in round three and almost finished. I bet him in that spot, and I was okay with minus 170, but it was because he wrestled in that in that fight. Um, you know, Bonfim obviously has a lot of holes and a lot of issues, but he's coming yeah. off his first career, like, defeat. It's been almost eight months. The guy's 26. I have to think that – He's going to be making some improvements. I know folks will probably line up to fade him because they got him last time, but I think he's going to finish, be the first guy to finish Angelusa, and I hope I get a decent price on like. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I'll take an ins- I might take an inside the distance line on him. I think it, honestly, based uh, off your based off your analysis, I kind of like the sub idea because if we like you said, we've seen Angelusa hurt before, not finished, and when he does get hurt, he shoots. Like didn't AJ Fletcher hurt him too, and he shot a takedown if I remember correctly. So like, if he hurts him and shoots, Bonfim has got a pretty good guillotine. Both brothers do. So I don't know. What do you think about that? What do you think about a sub line for that? If he hurts him. Although he could also just finish. I probably just, I probably, it's probably going to be like the same. You know what I mean? Like KO is probably going to be, KO is probably going to be juicy enough for me to want to take ITD and then a little bit of KO. Because mm-hmm. I bet you the sub and the ITD will be lined within like 25, 30 cents to where it's not worth playing. You know what I mean? It's not worth yeah. it. So. it yeah, Bonfim, he's minus 400 right now. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, when was he? He got down to 230. I mean, what was that a split second he was down there for? Yeah, I probably would have played 230. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I absolutely would have played 230. I, I just like how's that even real? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think Bonfim decide. Obviously, people are gonna count on the durability of Angelusa, everyone's gonna talk about it, but I don't really factor it in too much. Bonfim's an elite finisher. He the, he's the um, Gabe Bonfim, he's the one who's like the golden glove boxer, right? He's the one who's the real good boxer. The other one's the submission, the submission star. No, he's the, he's the he's the grappler. The other brother is the boxer. Your other brother's the boxer. That's yeah. what I'm saying. With two brothers. It's, I it's, it's really boxing is just like it's not very good, but I mean, it's he. I mean, his it, he's super athletic. Like he has a lot of he has a lot of upside in the UFC, in my opinion. And like I said, he's 26. Like he turns 27 in a like a month. Like this guy, 
I like. I think he has some upside. He just has some holes that he can clear up. I mean, I don't think he's been extended really in his entire career, except for like maybe a couple fights. So, just a big letdown spot. Um, but I don't really think Luce is much of a pace pusher that Dolby is. So, both will be lining up to fade him here, and I just don't think it's. I don't think it's something I'm interested in. I'll take some Bonfim ITD if it's decent plus money and some KO probably. Yeah, you know, know what the, we, might get a, we might get a decent like it. They might line it at like a two point five, um, and you can just bet the under one point five. You know, at like plus one thirty, one forty, and pretty much cover most of Bond Fiend's finish equity. Uh, I actually like that a lot. I like that idea a lot. What you talking about, like on DraftKings, the alternate. Yeah, I I, I don't know what the, it just depends what the price is. Like if this ITD is plus one forty, I. Or plus, if it's plus one forty in the unders, you know, plus one forty, I give him most of the finishing equity, so I probably just give take him ITD. It just depends on what the line is. You think they're going to give ITD plus odds? I would be yeah, very it'll probably it'll probably be minus something, but yeah, well, it, it'll be a weird fight. I don't know how they're going to line it. Obviously, the market's going to figure out what they want to do, but I, yeah. uh, I, 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 I favor bond theme, so I favor unders. So. Okay. If we get a if we get a good under one point five because Lusa hasn't been finished, I'll be taking a poke on it for sure. I like that. I like that. Um, let's go on to our next fight here. Um, Santiago Ponzinibbio versus Muslim Salikov. Uh, Santiago Santiago Ponzinibbio is he's thirty seven, six feet, seventy three inch reach. Um, Muslim Salikov forty five eleven, seventy inch reach. This is just an old man fight. Um, what are the odds? Odds they got Ponzinibbio minus two ten, Muslim plus one eighty. Interesting. Uh, um, my gut tells me Muslim early and Santiago late. That's kind of what that tells me. I think you know Santiago probably can if the fight extends, it probably favors him. What do you think? Yeah, I, I probably don't. I don't think I want anything to do with this fight at all. Um, I don't. I want anything. I guess I think I don't think it's completely yeah. guys fighting. And, like, I guess I lean maybe an under because both guys seem like – I mean, Muslim seems like he's done, but I, I just don't know. You know what I mean? Like, he fought Dalby. He fought Randy Brown. Um, Leach. Yeah, Leach, like – I mean, these guys, yeah, I mean, these guys are pretty good, you know? Um, so, like, I don't know how, like, how, like, how washed is Salikov? I guess everybody's going to say he's, like, uber washed, but he's facing pretty good guys. I mean, Ponzinibbio, the same thing. He's been facing some solid competition. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, this dude was getting pieced up by Alex Morono on the feet uh, for, yeah. three, for three rounds. So that's pretty bearish for me. Um Obviously, like, he had a pretty competitive fight with Michelle Pereira and Jeff Neal that he lost, which is, I mean, which is a good look, but, like, those fights were just weird, you know, and that was, Jeff Neal, you know, gives up minutes, and so does Michelle. When Michelle was at 170, he was giving up a lot of minutes, too. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I'm not super bullish on either side, but I don't think i want to get involved but the if this line gets to a price on muslim where like i have to play it i'll be interested but it's gonna have to be like two xx and a little bit more i think my my thought process is just um is muslim getting knocked out by randy brown is just i don't know the kind of telling about his chin randy brown doesn't really finish anyone to be honest um i think that's interesting um I don't know. I got no interest in betting this. I'm probably – this is one of those, like you said, um, honestly, you could probably see Muslim Salikov. I guess his, most of his equity is probably around one, right, on the feet. So you could always get a live line of Santiago, um, play it that way. Um, I was trying to think of what I would, I would play it, but I have no interest in playing this right off the bat. Um, probably an over, too, just because we're watching two old guys. No one's probably going to take chances. Um I don't, know. I don't see anything crazy going on here. Next fight. Um, next fight. Wait, that's a that's a good thought. There could be some value in like a boring staring match 
there. That's what I'm saying. The old guys, like two old guys. Like I called it with, uh, I said it with MVP Gary, even though that sub was a little nervous. That was just going to be them looking in a mirror because no one's going to want to take the risks or take the chances in that fight. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. We'll see. Main event, Rose Namajunas versus Tracy Cortez. Wow, dude, this card is so bad. Is actually so bad. Um, Rose Namajunas, 32, 5'5". Five, five. 65 inch reach tracy cortez 35 5 65 inch reach one's out of fight ready um rose is i think out of her husband's camp now or wherever she's out of um odds right now rose is minus 220 tracy cortez plus 185 i think this is a rose fight personally five rounds um tracy cortez may think she's able to strike based off the last fight even though she is a wrestler she had pretty good success on the feet Maybe it's going to give her false confidence. Rose is going to pick her apart on the feet. Rose has, is a champion fighter. Um, she's pretty good. Reboss's takedowns are concerning, but I think Tracy Cortez could definitely win a round early against Rose with takedowns. Um, so I like that. People are going to talk about that plus five and a half. I like that plus five and a half for Tracy Cortez. Probably going to be chalked though, but I could see her definitely winning a round or two. Going to be kind of close, but I think Rose takes over kind of towards the end or, you know, looks levels early that's kind of my thought process what do you think yeah i'm not i i bet cortez a two plus 205 um i think nice. she's a cleaner boxer in the pocket i like her boxing it looks very improved in the jasmine fight i mean jasmine's super hittable but at the end of the day rose was just like outstruck by amanda he like i i wasn't i'm not very bullish on on rose like right now on the feet like if, what if about the man in fight, though? What? What about the man in fight? I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of what impressed it's me, a, honestly. Man, it's not a good separator, though. You know what I mean? Like, she's more of a point fighter. Um, mm -hmm. So, at the end of the day, like, she's going to look good up against Manon because, you know, Manon's just going to do what she does and throw, like, a check hook and pivot off and throw front kicks and stomp kicks to the lead leg for 15 and win a minus EV decision. So I think folks are kind of overvaluing that performance because, you know, let's be real. Like she beat, you know, Aaron Blanchfield 50 to 45, but like it was dominant because obviously there's a big level gap in the striking, but it wasn't like she was knocking her down or having like insane moments. She was just calmly like out was lost on the feet. Yeah, she was just caught like she was. Yeah, it's like big difference in the striking between Rose and Rose and Aaron Blanchfield. So yeah, she's gonna look decent against Manon. Um and I think she'll look pretty good on the feet here against Tracy um, in moments. But I think Rose, like, I think I think Rose is just in terms of her decision equity historically, it's never been good. Um, you know, she landed a head kick, what, four years, like three or four years ago. Yeah. She knocked Joanna like six years ago. There's really nothing like in the current sample size from the past like four, like three, four years where I can be like, oh, yeah, let me can't wait to bet Rose at like minus 200 to get to this line. Um, Cortez is younger. Um, I like her camp. I know she's on short notice, but I believe she had a fight book. with. Yeah, she did have a fight book with Miranda Maverick, which was next week. So or which was, which was the, which will be on the July the 20th card. So yeah. she was, she's only missing like a week of camp that she normally would have had for this fight in theory. So I know she wasn't training for a five rounder, but if you look at Rose in her five round fights that go to decision, how many of those are split decisions? And yeah. if this fight does get extended, does she really have, you know, the ability to really separate her fights if she's not finishing early I would have to say no. Um, so I do think there's value on Cortez. Um, and yeah, she, I mean, she looked improved in the Jasmine fight, man. And like Jasmine's a Definitely. really, girl. Ja I mean, I rewatched that fight today. Jasmine's really, really hard to look good against. And she was pushing a crazy pace on yeah. um, Cortez. And that Rose is just not going to do that. That's just not her game. She doesn't push a pace on extended fights like that. And, um, in a lot of her fights, she's winning those split decisions because she's having, like, you know, wrestling and grappling upside, which if Jasmine's grappling Cortez, but Cortez has the ability to get up off bottom and, you know, scramble, I 
do think it's kind of bullish for Cortez here, to be honest, um, because in an extended fight, I don't see Rose pushing a pace. Um, and I think that she is live to uh, land some big hooks on the inside and look value. So That's fair. I mean, I, I kind of think it could look levels on the feed, though. I think there's a slim chance. I'm not really uh, con- uh, attributing like the wrestling as much of Cortez. I think it's just going to look levels on the feet. I actually kind of think I stand, although Rose hasn't looked that way lately. Looking back at that uh, Esparza fight, do you think Esparza actually won that, or would you have given that to Rose? I could care less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I Talking. could care less. But, I, but, but here's the thing, right? That happened. Yeah, it did. I, you, you, said you're I, actually, I, you actually brought up a good point with this the split decision against Esparza, split against Wei Li. Um, let's see if she's got any other splits here. Yeah, split I thought, against... I she, and Carol. I thought she lost this fight to Andrade. So it's like... Outside mm-hmm. of in the last like six years of da- of data, she's won two splits, right? Mm-hmm. Out of that period of time, she's landed a, a landed a head kick on Wei Li. Yep, <laughs> and beat Rebus. So two split decisions, one head kick, and beating Rebus, who's a one a one a, who's a straw weight now. Yeah. And Rebus is I don't I'm not really too high on Rebus either to be completely honest. So yeah, who would you rather who would you rather be in a striking fight? Who would you take in a striking fight, Rebus or Cortez? Probably Cortez at this rate. Yeah, and that strike and in my opinion that that fight on the feet was rather close. So mm. uh, I kind of think it's also just because of Hebas's he must have taken a lot of damage lately. That's kind of more my thing. And we know like uh, Cortez has got a chin. I don't know. You're not. You're not going to worry about that with her. So, I don't know. Oh, it's going to be an interesting one. I think honestly, I have my two bets, and I have Rose minus 160, and I have Juliana Rosa plus 220. I think I'll probably get involved on Gabriel Bonfim under or inside the distance. Maybe the over on this style call of Plaza Nibio. I think it all comes down to the numbers. Looking at this slate, maybe get on Brundage, but I don't know. I yeah. have uh, I have an earlier Agapova line right now, which I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with it <laughs> at, at plus two seventy. Um, it's not a bad line just to ride with, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not I'm not super bullish on it to be honest. I mean, it could be one of those fights where two seventy. If she dies, she dies. You know. Yeah, I mean, she'll probably look value for like a round. I hope. I well, I'm hoping she looks value for like the first five minutes six minutes to where i get it at like i you know luan is like minus 150 or something after round yeah. or like minus you know minus well i hope like minus 150 at like 50 ish like slight juice because she did drop round one and i can just bet on uh santos and pretty much cover my position yeah. and and free roll a, a luana santos bet as this fight extends do you do you, do you hedge an arb a lot live do you and make make a lot of money that way or make a lot of units that way i i i don't personally most of the time i'm betting an underdog that has upside in the that i think has upside and then i'll pretty much free roll that underdog position on a live bet so i did yeah. it with Cup- Johnson this weekend, I bet him at 218 because I thought the fight was, was going to be close. Yeah, yeah, it, we talked about that, yeah. Yeah, if it got extended. And so they were picking him in round three on the live line. So instead of, like, betting Feely to win, you know, to win a unit because I had to bet on Cub for a unit, yeah. I just I just played Feely at minus 115 to cover my position on Cub at 218. Yeah. So I could have won – I could have won a unit on Cub, but if he loses the decision, I lose nothing. So I have all the upside, but no downside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. That's how, I, that's how I choose to play some of my underdogs where I think they do have some upside in the fight that I can use the, use that opportunity to sort of free roll uh, a kind of a free underdog bet. And depending on how I'm feeling the fight is going in the cardio narratives, specifically yeah. for like Pova, that's going to be a position where I'm going to get all the way off and play Santos. But yeah. For the Swanson fight, I'm going into a 50-50 decision, and I have, you know, I can stake a lot less and and, and have all the upside. So that's kind of how I choose to do it if I'm playing an underdog. Um, mm-hmm. So that that's kind of where I'm at. That's the same kind of way I feel about the Arujo fight. So anyway, so let's talk. Let's do a while. Well, we just we're just over 39 minutes. Let's take five minutes. We got we'll go to 45 minutes. Um, 
let's recap through um the last the fight car. Let's recap 303. Um we talked before watching the Diego Lopez that fought uh Dan Ige, I think he probably would have smoked Ortega. Probably. Um obviously looking at the round three. Danny, dude, I respect the fuck out of Danny Ige for doing that. I think that was the coolest fucking thing. And then also breaking him in the third round and getting him like winning. That's a five round fight. I think Danny Ige wins that fight. You know, what did you think of that one? If that if Ortega was still in that ring that night, how do you think that would have went? Um, I don't, I don't know because I think Ige didn't really press the press a pace like Ortega would. So I had a bet on, I had a bet on Lopes, but. Obviously, Ortega had some issues, like, with his health or his weight. And just yeah. wasn't, to be honest, I just don't think he was ready to fight. So, I, that made me bullish on my Lopes bet because he didn't make it to the fight. Personally, I think, I actually think Ige is, like, a worse matchup for him. He's got, yeah. he's a better, he's a, he's a better wrestler for sure. He's got. How about that Darce choke? Getting out of that deep transitional Darce choke that he had in, it was crazy. Yeah, I, I and I think Ige did have I think and I think Ige is like super, obviously Ige is super durable. Um so I, I thought Ige was like if I thought Ige was just as tough of a matchup as Ortega personally. Um so that I mean it was it didn't make me super bullish on my low bet low bet with how he looked in round three, but he dominated honestly ten minutes of that fight. And we have to put yeah. it in context, like, you know, Ige looked great, but Lopes also had to Cut weight to 45, had to rehydrate to 55. His opponent got canceled four hours before he was about to go fight. He got an opponent at 65. So, I mean, just the fact that he had, he dealt with all of that and still won the fight with all of the nerves. I mean, Ige had nothing to lose in that position. So, if I'm Lopes and I've gone through all this stress, it's got to be taxing, you know? Yeah, definitely. That, of course. And then um, I, had a, I had a bet on Yuri. I got him plus 150. Kind of thinking, you know, after seeing round one and round two of that first fight, like, hey, this could be the same. But obviously, Alex made his reads, man. He made his reads well. He got ready for that takedown defense, everything he had to do. And, I mean, he smoked him. Honestly, that fight was done in round one after that first knockdown. But he walked out there and then just threw a head kick. Like, that's that was the net, it was like a dagger, the nail in the coffin, right? Like, there was nothing else. What did you think of that? Did you have anything on Pereira or, or Yuri? No, I, I, I didn't have a lot of bets on the card, to be honest. I've been keeping my everything pretty tight where I think I have an edge on. And so I didn't – I only had a bet on four fights last uh, – on, on 303. So I had a bet on um, Vinicius Oliveira at 205 for 1.5 units. I had – Nice. On Gene Silva at plus 170 for 1.5 units. I had a bet on Swanson that I free rolled live. At plus 218, I had a Piper submission bet. Silly. Um, <laughs> I mean, his Piper walked out there and smoked him. Yeah, I had a Talbot bet, a Talbot submission bet too. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I had uh, Macy Chasson round two. And then I had Macy Chasson round three. So um, you're Macy, you're Macy round, round two cashed, right? Yeah, yeah, my Macy round two cashed. I got her money line plus 135. I was actually pretty happy with that bet. Um, that was probably my biggest dog that hit. Um, I lost on – I had lock dog, um, but I had him – it was plus 165 for him to finish inside the distance. Decision is no bet. Um, so I just pushed on that one. Um, i trying to think what else I had. What else did I have this card? Um what did you think of uh, what do you think of Peyton Talbot? I had him round two, round three, but he didn't even make it twenty seconds into the fight. So, what do you think of this guy? Is he actually the truth or what? I mean, not much to say about him. He is uh, obviously quite the prospect, um, and I bet him in his contender series fight. I remember him from A One Combat. Uh, I bet him in the Simon fight. I like him as a fighter. Um, mm-hmm. Interested to see where he goes. So. Oh, I had Waterson. Waterson is a dog. I got her plus 150 or plus 160. Oh, my God. How bad was that, bro? I didn't, you couldn't even watch that, but I watched round one and I just walked away. Went and did other shit. Came back. I just knew how that was. Oh, wait. Stuff. I had I had some Budai sub, too. Sub bets as well. Like, my 
my prop plays were terrible outside of the Macy round two, which was somewhat fortunate, but I would have liked, yeah. I, I would have liked to see that fight play out because like MBS sold out in round one and then immediately into round two gives up a takedown and Macy's on top of her. She has no interest in getting up off her back. So no. I I was interested to see how that fight played out. Obviously I'm fortunate to cash like the plus 16, 1600 ticket, but like, there is a possibility that there is a finish that presents itself. I I could have live at Macy after round one at like plus two hundred, which I was was my initial read. Yeah, um, that that was the one that, in my opinion, like out of all the fights this weekend, that was my one big mistake because obviously I played Macy round two, round three for a reason, um, mm-hmm. and I and I just for some I just for some reason missed out on the live bet opportunity at a great number. Um, that was the real one miss I had this week. Um, passing on Robertson was something I was, I was waiting to play Robertson. Um, and for some reason, when I saw Watterson Gomes crying on her walkout, I was like, I should be betting this. And for some reason I waited for the live line to open up and she yeah. hit, the, she hit, she hit her first takedown. And I was like, Oh, it's over with. Like, I'm not- yeah, that's exactly right. It's the same thing. I was, I was out with my buddies and I saw that and I go, oh, I know how this fight, I've seen this story a million times. I know exactly how this one's going to go. Um, I played Jordan round two, round three, plus 2000, plus 2700. I got addicted to playing long shot parlays ever since I hit Felipe Lima round three, two weeks ago. So now I'm starting to sprinkle these little long shots into my mix for like, you know, chump change, lunch money. And those were just completely, I mean, he got absolutely worked by Gene Silva. Um, yeah, my, my, per, I'm not a big prop guy personally, unless I have like a really, really strong read on a fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of it has to come from like my own intuition about like the possibilities and like the outcome. And if I don't feel like that's a viable outcome, I don't even care what the number is. So, yeah. I, and that, that's like the one biggest thing I have, like, I, I try to focus on is like, you know, the Gene Silva one, right? It's like, well, Gene's never been finished, and he looks like he's super durable and has really good cardio based on the Vallejos fight. He hasn't yeah. faced a lot of resistance, but there's nothing on tape that says that, like, he slows down at all in any of his fights. Yeah. yeah. And that, and but for, but for like, something else like Bueno Silva, she's sloppy as hell in round two and round three. So yeah. that's something that I can capitalize on. So that's, yeah. that's, that's my only that's like my only thing and like even Pfeiffer it's like that's a stupid bet because he could have easily nuked Mark Andre Burial in round one like yeah. I could have easily just taken the inside the distance line because I thought he was going to run through him and have sit instead of playing 550 for something that was like a long shot but it's 550 I mean yeah like that's that's great that's okay like that, it looks good if it hits but if you throw money away on something like all the time itd was plus 110 plus 100 and ko was 200 like that had a lot of value on the itd line so joe piper by ko is plus 200 yeah exactly that's Dude, what I, I so i i had renat i had uh renat and piper parlayed together for minus 120 so i didn't honestly didn't even look into his props or anything i just had my piper bet and i was just fine with that just take it for what it is yeah, that's in my in my personal opinion that's the one thing that sucks if you like i don't parlay really at all but when you do parlay i used to have that thing where i'd like put it in the parlay the first leg would win and you're like i'm good it's over with cash money let's just let it ride yeah, yeah and then, but then there's already value like if you already feel like your favorites like oh i would have played plus 200 on the k i thought that would have been you know even, plus 115 yeah even money yeah I mean, that's, and that's what sucks sometimes is like, you just like, that was, that was, and I played the sub at plus two, five fifty. like what the yeah. fuck are you doing? You know what I mean? Why am I not just playing the ITV? He could easily knock this guy out. Uh, that was my read. Right. But instead yeah. you listen, you listen, you know, you get influenced a little bit and then you make, you make a, a, a clerical error where, you know, you, you lose money. other shows, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah you, you lose money because you're not going with your own reads because you're like, Oh, this is juicy. And that's how props can get you in the long run, you know, because yeah. you look late and you're like, oh, I had all these great bets. And then two weeks from them, you're like, 
what the fuck? I threw away like five units the past two or three weeks. Yeah, just five. dropping lunch money over and over and over. Again. Yeah, and then well, and then one of them hits right, and you make four units, but it's like okay, you're still down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like I yep. had, I had a fortunate, I had a fortunate. I mean, I had I, PFL was good. I had Braga KO two three on Fanduel at like six hundred, mm -hmm. and that covered like all of my prop sprinkles on UFC, and then Chasson too like covered a bunch so it's great it's like you know cool but i threw away so much money on terrible terrible prop plays that you have to look at it and be like all right i have to obviously rethink my strategy of like if this dude has massive ko upside early why am i playing the submission prop because it might and it's only 500 it might die in a second you know yeah there's not enough value on it and sometimes you make that mistake like Definitely. I, I heard a lot of people on like Cub Swanson KO at plus 450, 500. And like mm -hmm. money line's 218. You know? Why not to play the money line? Yeah. yeah. In, terms of, in terms of the percentages of how much of an edge you have once you get to a certain number, there's not that big of a difference, you know? From yeah. like minus 110 to minus 225, it's, you know, 53 ish percent. And then you get to 225, it's 70. Yeah. But yep. from. But from like minus, you know, two twenty five to minus four hundred, it's only ten percent. So 10%. yeah, yeah, you're going two dollars and you know two dollars worth of you know actual line. The line is ten percent, but then it's actually less than two dollars. You know, yeah. But then from this on this tighter odds ranges, the percentages are much higher. So that's how they get you with props. It's the same shit. It's like. Yeah. The percentage is, is not worth it. It's like, oh, I'm getting an extra $4, you know, an extra $2 of value, but it's 10%. Yeah, so, if he's going to hit that, he's going to hit the money line anyway. Yeah. If well, anything, play money line that. and then sprinkle the prop. Well, that's why I played, that's why I played Loke Dog, right? Is because I thought he had a lot of KO equity yeah. at plus 200, but the KO is plus 400. So I'm only getting like 10-ish percent. And I'm like, yeah. is this really worth a 10-ish percent to throw away? Maybe he wins a decision, which he ends up winning a decision. Maybe what was his decision prop? Do you know? It was plus seven hundred. I looked at it before the fight, uh, and I I, pa I, pa I passed on it. But I personally thought money line and decision was good because it's plus seven hundred and the KO is four hundred. The money line is yeah. two hundred. That edge is enough for me to just play the money line and call it a day. Yeah, um, definitely. So what that's, do you think? That, yeah, that's how I'm choosing yeah. to think about it because those props, in terms of just the percentiles, it's not enough of an edge to actually bet some of them. Yeah, no, that's good knowledge too. It's good for people to know. That's why I'm glad I like to do shows like this. We talk about this. People get to learn the difference between those things. <laughs> that you're shooting props. Um, yeah, I mean, props are great, right? Like everybody goes on, you know, yada yada show, and they talk about prop this, prop that. But at the end of the day. I will say a lot of the folks that are firing on props, they're betting like they're betting like a unit on 10 props. It's like, dude, my I don't have my unit size does not allow me to get a whole that unit down. I can't yes. get a whole unit down on it. Like it's hard for me to get a unit down on a KO prop unless I bet it on like three different books. Yeah. You know? And I'm not yeah. tipping them out. I'm not tipping them out anyways, but like I can't get down like, you know, a unit or a unit and a half on a Joe Pfeiffer KO prop that's best market on FanDuel. Like I can't get down on that all the way. No, yeah. no. Let's go. Let's go over one thing before we leave. What What do we think about the jujitsu improvements of Ian Gary? I was actually very impressed. Um, his uh, my I thought his jujitsu was always pretty good. Um, he grappled. I don't know if you watch the fight. He grappled Jack Grant in Cage Warriors. Yeah, no, no. He used to, that's what I was telling my boys when I was sitting with them. I'm like, people don't realize if you go back to his Cage Warriors, he was wrestling a lot more in Cage Warriors than when he came to the yeah. UFC. So, like, I knew he had the wrestling upside, but then, like, seeing Damian Maya in his corner, he's got those long limbs, bro. He pulled that, he pulled, he went to go pull that um, knee bar or that, uh, the leg lock. And, dude, his, he had that, like, cinched in from just sitting on his back because he has long ass legs. That was kind of crazy to see. I'm like, MVP is good, probably practices that stuff because everyone wants to take him down and sub him. But, like, you catch a guy who isn't looking at that, they're in trouble from there. Yeah. I mean, I he mean, had the back. His transition was, to the was, back was good. I was I was very impressed with the back takes. That, that's, really what, that's really what impressed me. I mean, just, 
just his ability to get to the back is very impressive. Like we have we have not seen that. Like it's obviously he he's a pretty good rapper on tape, but like we haven't seen him you know get to the back like that in a lot of uh, a lot of his fights. So oh, he's, me, that, he's starting impressive. to choke and everything. Yeah, I mean, you're naked. That was we haven't seen MVP in that much trouble like ever. Really, I don't think. Uh, I gotta think about it. In okay, terms of I, the grap, in terms of the grappling, in, grap, in terms of grappling, like taken down and someone has his back and the choke is almost in. Like I don't think I've ever seen him like that. Like Colin got him down, but he was never in trouble really. I don't. I think he fought Goichi Yama Yamamushi or whatever his name is and hmm. Bellator. I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to look back on the fight because Goichi is a good back taker. I don't know. I don't know if he got his back. Um, that well, how about me and Gary thinking he was faster on the feet, bro? That was comedy. That was comedy. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the thought process going in that Gary was that it was going to be like a close striking fight, and that obviously wasn't. Um, no, but... it wasn't close at all. I, did, I honestly, I was, I had a uh, plus odds ticket on MVP. I was happy with it. I know Dana said he saw a draw. I was kind of okay with it going like I could see it going 29 28 Gary or 29 28. I could see it going either way, you know, like I wasn't upset with losing money there just because of like, I could see, you know, round two round or round one, round three was pretty heavy with grappling and submission attempts, everything like that. From Gary. And then round two was pretty dominant. And every round um, MVP was landing like the bigger punches, like on the feet, like that's anything that was happening was MVP. So I wasn't really upset with the 29, 28 either way, honestly. Yeah. I, uh, I, I was tempted to play MVP before, but I just, I just knew that the possibility I, – I felt like the closing line, as stupid as this might sound, I know the fight was close. It's one of these weird things where it's like I know the fight was close, but I still feel like the closing line was accurate, if that makes sense. Like yeah. minus 190, 200, like close to the 60 – like in the cl- – like closing closer to 70%, like over 65%. Even though that fight looks 50-50, I feel like with Gary's IQ and the grappling upside, he wins that fight closer to 65%. Because if he gets if he gets any grappling going, he's taking his back and consolidating position immediately and winning that round. Yeah. What do you think so, about this? Now, that, now they're talking about Gary versus Shothcott. What do you think of that? Oh, come on. You know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm thinking Shothcott. I hope I'm not super <laughs> <scared>. <laughs> That's, I hope I'm not square by saying honestly, that. But I'm thinking Shavkat by like a million. That could honestly be like sanctioned. That could be sanctioned murder, honestly. Like, I, dude, he was like, "Yo, I know you used to kick your ass back at Killcliffe," and Shavkat was like, "Dude, I don't think you're remembering the fights the right way." <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I don't think that would be good for Ian, but he is he's open to take that fight, and they give they give me a decent line on Gary. I'll take it. Oh my god! I don't think we'll get. No, I'm not gonna play. I, I wouldn't play Gary against Shavkat. There, there are certain fighters like. I mean, that. unless it was a crazy number, you give me like a crazy, crazy number, then yeah, I'll take, I'll take the dog shot. But no, I, 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 I've talked to you about this before. There's just like certain fighters I won't bet against, regardless of the number, mm-hmm. and because I don't, I don't want to fade. Like I'm just like I'm just not gonna fade him. You know, I'm just don't, I'm not going to because it's yeah. not. Worth it. Like what? Because because even if I win, I'm gonna be like, oh great, I won, cool. But that my read is that like I just don't want to get in front of them, so I don't even look at the fight. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. But all right, let's wrap this show up. It's 58 minutes. We'll close it in under hour. I really appreciate you joining us. Obviously, friend of the show. Happy to have you anytime. You got anything you want to your Discord? Anything you want to throw out there before we close it up? No, I don't have a Discord. I don't have anything. I'm there's something in the works with the show for me on YouTube. Um, okay. No formal announcements yet, but uh, the uh, it's going to be a conceptual show um, where me and my the, well, the host of the show, I'll be the co-host, will be discussing the thought process around uh, what you're betting on in a particular fight. And the questions that you need answered when you go into tape um, and try to understand what's, what could happen, the possible outcomes, and what questions you need answered to provide possible analysis and value uh, on betting. That's pretty it. cool. It's gonna, no, we're not going to talk about predictions. Uh, we're not going to talk about who wins the fight because everybody does that. 
but yeah. we will we will discuss the deeper point and thought process of how does the fight look and what's the what are the issues that are holding us back from picking a side okay well i'll be adding that in my weekly rota- rotation that sounds pretty good <laughs> yeah i mean you, i, I you like know, I mean, that that's, that's- that's how that's how I always think about fights. Like I always I'm always talking to people and asking them like if they have a bet on a particular fight, like why did you make this bet? You know what I mean? Like what's your read? And then yeah. as soon as they give me my read, the first thing I the first thing I I, I I try to figure out is I try to poke holes in their argument. Yeah. Even if I don't care about the bet, right? Or even if I'm thinking about betting the other side. I've sometimes been dissuaded from picking a side because somebody has given me a legitimate reason and I went into tape and I found that reason and I mi- and I would have made, I would have in theory bet something I wouldn't have if I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And like, if they, if they give you a reason and it's, it's foolproof, you're like, okay, they have, they have a good read. The read's clear. Yeah. Everything, everything that I do is like, it, it has to be logical. It has to be thought out. I don't do anything um mostly on UFC if I have enough data to support my angle I'll you know I'm not gonna bet it you know you um, got any uh you got any um regional scenes you want to give out while you're on here we might uh, give the people some LFA 187 Brazil is on this week um one championship also has a card there's four MMA fights LFA Brazil is an interesting card I am I don't have any action right now. The lines are up and people want to look. Um, limits aren't open yet. So I'm not, I don't really wait. I, I just wait until limits open up and totals open up before I place wagers because yeah. I don't know what line I'm going to get on some of these fights to actually like be able to bet them. Like they're pretty chalky across the board for this LFA. I will say one thing you should do for these LFA Brazil cars if you see these big, 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 big favorites, look at the total. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just leave you. I'll leave you with that, and you can figure out what to do with it. You'll know. <laughs> okay. All right. I like that. I'm gonna take a look at that this week. They, they don't have totals out yet. I'm just looking at money lines here. Is there PFL this week or no? There's not, right? I, think, I don't think so. I didn't see it. I I have the. I always just track it off the tape. Oh then. yeah, it's PFL Ridia or the uh, no, Ria. PFL, PFL Mena is like the next week. It's the 12th, I think. Oh okay okay. Yeah, PFL Mena is the twelfth. It's on Friday, so this week is really slow. But next week there's P- there's like next week is it, there's a lot of regionals. Aries, I think Aries A one, PFL Mena, um, yeah, there's a couple, and then the following week there's even more. Yeah, but all right, cool man. I appreciate you joining again, and uh, we'll talk. And I'll, I'll upload this probably tomorrow morning. Yeah. All right, bro. I'll catch you. Thanks again for joining. Um, That's first look, Denver. Looks like it's going to suck. That's our first look. (laughs) All right. Peace.